Dear Mother, You believe you are going to find an interesting story, but I don't want you to be deceived. The story you are going to read is not the story of my life, but the intimate life of a poor soul, who, without any merit on her part, Jesus Christ loved in a special way and filled abundantly with his favors and graces. Juanita was born on July 13, 1900, in Santiago, Chile. She was the fourth of six children, although one had died just hours after she was born. Juanita was born in affluence, as she says in her diary, Jesus did not desire me to be born poor like himself. I was born in the midst of riches, spoiled by all. Her family was a wealthy farming family with a big rambling house, many horses, and lots of land. Teresa was born baptized Juanita after a family argument on what to name her. Her father wanted her to be named after his mother, Henrietta, and her mother wanted Juanita to be named after her own mother, Juana. And so Juanita was given the names of both grandmothers, Juana Henrietta. And just to complicate things a little bit further, they threw in the name Josephine because her mother had a special devotion to St. Joseph and then both parents agreed to add the title of the Sacred Hearts because they had a devotion to the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. So she was baptized Juana Henrietta Josephine of the Sacred Hearts, but they shortened it just to Juanita. Juanita was naturally good and cheerful. She was also very pretty and was told so secretly by all the family members, except for her mother, who didn't want Juanita's head getting too big with vanity. Later on in life, Juanita did struggle a little over vanity, but she tried very hard to work on it by practicing humility. She wrote of it later, From the time I was small, they used to tell me I was the prettiest of my sisters, but I paid no attention to this. But they kept repeating these same words to me as I grew older, unbeknown to my mother, since she didn't like this. God alone knows what it cost me to overcome this pride and vanity that took possession of my heart as I grew older. She also struggled very much with her temper. As she says in her diary, she was the family's favorite, so she was spoiled and used to getting her own way. At 15 years old, Juanita began to keep a diary for her spiritual director, Mother Rios. Like St. Therese of Lisieux, she wrote the story of her life. Without this diary, we would never know the spiritual heights that she had attained. The 1906 earthquake made a big impression on Juanita, even though she was only six years old at the time. As she said, after the earthquake is when Jesus began to take my heart to be his own. She began to desire to make her Holy Communion, but was told that she was too young. During this time, she was to suffer very much, which would mature her soul. She says, While I waited to make my first Holy Communion, the Virgin Mary helped me to cleanse my soul of every imperfection. Her suffering started with simply being told that she had to wait to receive communion. She asked every day and was always told no. As she was growing and maturing, she began to recognize her weaknesses and faults, and so she worked very hard on herself, although this wasn't easy. She had a temper, which she often describes as making my blood boil. When referring to school, which she hated because she preferred to be home, she would call it a jail or a dungeon and said that it should be burned to the ground. Other times she would rebel by simply taking her time to obey when told to do something. It was costly for me to obey, especially when I was ordered to do something, and then out of negligence I took my time in doing it. Her grandfather, whom she loved very much, died when she was seven years old. Juanita was very close to her grandfather, and it was another reminder to her how short life is. She writes, Every evening, Grandfather made us mount a horse, flipping a coin to see who would be first. Rebecca always won. He was in good health until one night he was stricken with an attack of paralysis. May 13th, the day of his death, he received the sacraments. He called all his children and counseled them. By the side of his room, there was an oratory. They began to say Mass when they saw his face filled with great fear, and he kept saying, take him away while he covered his face with his hands. There were terrible temptations from the devil. My mother threw holy water on him and the devil left. He suffered more spiritual attacks. 
And then Juanita tells us that at the consecration of the Mass, when the sacred host was elevated, he died. His death made a lasting impression to young Juanita, who said, His death was that of a saint, as was his life. This was the beginning of Juanita's mystical experiences as her grandfather began to appear to her after her death. She writes, I used to see my grandfather appear at the foot of the bed, but I didn't see more than half of his body. He appeared to me for eight days. I was scared to death and went to Rebecca's bed. From that time on, I no longer saw him. At 10 years old, Juanita was finally allowed to receive communion, and for the whole month of June, the month of the Sacred Heart, she writes, I modified my character completely. I did this to such an extent that my mother was very happy to see me preparing myself so well for my first communion. After receiving communion, which Juanita describes as a cloudless day, she said that she heard the voice of Jesus speak to her soul for the first time. It would become something almost ordinary for Juanita to hear the voice of Jesus, who counseled her on how to pray and how to become holy. In fact, it was so ordinary to her that she was surprised to find out that not everyone heard the voice of Jesus during communion. Shortly after her first communion, Juanita thought of heaven only and began to desire to go there. She writes, I told the Virgin everything. From that day on, the earth no longer held attraction for me. I wanted to die and beg Jesus that he take me on the 8th of December, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Jesus heard her prayer, and although he didn't allow her to die, he did allow her to get sick and suffer. She writes, Every year I used to become sick on the 8th of December, so much that I believed I was going to die. When I was 12, I came down with diphtheria. I was near death, and my mother believed that I was dying because an aunt died of the same illness when she was 12 years old, and I was worse than she was. When she was 13, she had a terrible fever on the 8th of December. Again, she thought she would die, but recovered. On the following year, 1914 of December 8th, she had appendicitis. During this illness, Juanita suffered very much and received much counsel from our Lord. She said that as she lay sick in bed, she began to feel troubled about something. She brought this to Our Lady, who gave her bad advice. Juanita was confused and said, This is not the voice of my mother, because she can't be telling me this. I called her and she said that the devil had answered me. I became fearful. Then she told me that whenever I heard the voice, I should ask, Are you my mother? And this is what I always do. Another time, as she was lying in bed with the same illness, Jesus spoke to her. She had been upset and lonely because her older sister was sick, and everyone left Juanita alone to attend to her. She heard the voice of Jesus say, What? I, Juanita, am alone on the altar for love of you, and you can't even suffer for a moment? She says, From that time the dear Jesus spoke to me, I spent entire hours conversing with him. That's the reason I enjoyed being alone. He went on teaching me how I should suffer and not complain, and about intimate union with himself. Then he told me he wanted me for himself and that he would like me to become a Carmelite. And so Juanita did not die. She had an operation for her appendicitis, but suffered from the effects of the anesthesia that was used, which caused her nervous system to go haywire. As stated before, Juanita didn't like school at all because she preferred to be with her family, and this school was a boarding school. Despite this, she was a very good student and was ahead of her class in all subjects. She wanted to attain high grades to make her parents happy. School is where Juanita really grew in holiness. She learned to serve others and to be a mentor to some of the younger students. She still struggled occasionally with her temper as some of the young girls sometimes wouldn't listen when she needed them to. She writes of the incident in her diary. The other day, the little girls were misbehaving at table, and I became very impatient. Since I let them go on talking, I was told that I should have been stricter with them. I said they didn't want to listen to me. I became very angry, and when I saw the children, I told them that they were disagreeable. Would Jesus have acted in that way? Of course not. He would have scolded them and would not have excused them, but he wouldn't have insulted them as I did. It's true that it took me a long time to get control of myself, but afterwards I spoke of my anger, and the next day to humble myself, I begged forgiveness from the children. These falls serve to make me aware that I'm still very imperfect. 
In confession, she wrote down what the priest counseled regarding impatience. I went to confession yesterday. The priest told me that three things are necessary to avoid impatience. Number one, never manifest my anger outwardly. Number two, be lovable with the person who causes my anger. And number three, to be silent, to put down anger. She wanted to perform strict penances, but her confessor instead advised her to do lighter penances, such as praying with her arms out in the form of a cross or avoiding sweets. Later, he permitted her to wear a hair shirt. When Juanita graduated from high school, she desired to enter the Carmelite convent. However, like St. Therese, she faced obstacles. Her father, who had lost the family fortune due to poor handling of finances, was now gone most of the time on business trips, which caused Juanita a lot of sadness as she missed him very much. She had to ask him through letters for his permission to enter Carmel and for money for a dowry. Although he did eventually grant permission, which made Juanita very happy, the rest of her family was not. Her older brother, Luis, was very angry that she was leaving the family to be a nun. He felt that she had far too many gifts and beauty to be wasted behind the walls of a cloister. In fact, the day before she was about to enter, he wrote her a long letter, trying hard to talk her out of going. As this would have grieved most, Juanita understood her brother and responded with love. At one time, she and her brother were very close. It was he who taught her to have devotion to the Blessed Virgin, and he that she had made a pact with to say the rosary together every day. In fact, she only missed one day when she forgot. As her brother entered his teen years, he began to have doubts about his faith and began to live a life of drinking and partying, which grieved her mother so much that she begged God to take him rather than live a life of sin. It was to this brother that Juanita gave her beloved statue of the Blessed Virgin, she who had earned it years before during one of her sicknesses by taking her medicine in trade for the statue. She had already had a meeting with the Mother Prioress and all agreed that she would be most welcome. Before entering Carmel, she had her photograph taken in the Carmelite habit. This was the custom in those days since no photography equipment was allowed in the convent. Here she is clothed in a black veil of a fully professed sister. However, Juanita only received the white veil of a postulant since she didn't live long enough. On May 7, 1919, Juanita entered the convent on the feast of her patron, St. Joseph. Juanita was like a newlywed on her honeymoon. She knew nothing but happiness. She writes, It's been eight days since I have been in Carmel, eight days of heaven, I feel the divine love to be so great that there are moments when I feel I'm unable to resist. When she received the habit, she was formally given the name Sister Teresa of Jesus. Those early days were nothing but happiness, and the sisters that knew her say that she would often go into giggling fits. One time, things got so out of hand that the priest who was visiting was unable to say grace after meals, much to his annoyance. For 11 months, St. Teresa only knew happiness. She spoke of her happiness often, telling a friend in a letter that she was the happiest creature on earth. On Holy Week of 1920, Sister Teresa absorbed herself in prayer and contemplation of the suffering of Jesus. Yet, on Holy Thursday, St. Teresa fell ill. She didn't say anything to anyone about it and spent long hours on her knees. The mother prioress noticed Sister Teresa's pale face and fever-flushed cheeks and immediately called the doctor and sent her to bed. It was determined she had typhus, and as she had been sick for weeks, it had progressed into advanced stages. They contacted Sister Teresa's family, and her mother immediately sent over the family physician to oversee her care. Sister Teresa was in and out of delirium from her high fever, she also suffered extreme spiritual darkness. When she was 17 years old, she offered herself for any death the Lord wanted to give her, even the death of abandonment, and it appears that the Lord accepted her offering. When she wasn't delirious, Mother Angelica, fearing the end was near, suggested that Sister Teresa make her religious vows in the Carmelite order. In those days, this was allowed under special circumstances. Sister Teresa made her profession shortly after midnight, and she prayerfully repeated the formula three more times with great emotion. 
Later, she received the Holy Viaticum. On April 12, 1920, Sister Teresa died. She was 19 years and 9 months old. Her family came to view the body one last time. They were all heartbroken, of course. Her sister Rebecca would end up joining the same cloister a few months later. The funeral overwhelmed and surprised everyone as large crowds came to pay their respects. This was very surprising as Sister Teresa was a cloistered nun and no one from the Los Andes area even knew about her and nothing had been done to publicize the services. Even more surprising was how many priests came. This affected especially her brother Luis, who still struggled with his doubts. However, the magnitude of how many people came amazed and moved him. He watched in awe that instead of going home after the funeral mass, people stayed to touch the rosaries and medals against Sister Teresa's body. Somehow, everyone knew that she was a saint. Later, he would say that his sister's life and death were his greatest moral miracle. After the two required miracles for her canonization were approved, Pope John Paul II canonized her as St. Teresa of the Andes on Columbus Day, 1992.